we are excited about sound transit work in building a regional transit system and we are looking forward to linking it up to Bellevue next year but the question is when will West Seattle get connected are you excited about the plans revealed in the draft environmental impact statement which is out for review now we have a proposal for sound transit uh, could accomplish the West Seattle portion of that plan in a way which would not only deliver it sooner, but would also save money so that even more communities can be connected to transit sooner. Population growth has led to growing traffic congestion. Sun Transit was created to build a regional public transit system to relieve the mounting pressure on our roadways. But growth in West Seattle specifically has resulted in more vehicles on bridges and the opening of Terminal 5 will increase truck traffic further. Last summer's climate events have been a reminder to decarbonize our transit sooner rather than later and offer alternatives to individual car use. When voters approved Sound Transit 3 in 2016, the promise was to connect the junction to the stadium by 2030 and with downtown by 2035 for $1.7 billion. But since then, the cost for the West Seattle Link connection has almost doubled to at least $3.2 billion meaning a quarter million dollar for each of the 13,000 riders. Now, section two of the Sound Transit 3 motion allows the board to modify the plan in case they are deemed unaffordable, impractical, or infeasible. So far, Sound Transit is just planning to extend the property and sales tax and vehicle registration fees to cover the additional cost. The current plan is to use light rail technology, which is great if you can build it along I-5 or some major corridor, but West Seattle is a lot more complicated. Not only do we need to cross the river, we also need to get up the hill through dense development. That means building a new bridge across the Duwamish River and getting around Pitching Point while staying away from the traffic heading towards the port. Sound Transit just published their draft environmental impact study showing that over 600 residences and businesses, meaning over 2000 people may be impacted for the benefit of moving 13,000 riders a day of which half of them will arrive already by bus. Some people favor a partial tunnel but it would not avoid the destruction at at Youngstown, Pitching Point and its northern Greeton Belt, and it would require road closures and detours along key arteries for several years. Didn't we suffer enough from the bridge closure? The pandemic showed how diverse and low-income neighborhoods such as in the southern part of our peninsula depend on transit. Sound Transit 3 includes a budget to plan for a southern extension but construction isn't funded and therefore may not happen until 2050 or later. Let's look at some of the challenges in more detail. While the West Seattle Bridge only goes up over the West Duwamish waterway, Sound Transit envisions the light rail to go from the Soto station up quite high over the existing bridge, bridge approach and then continues for two miles at about eight to 15 stories high in the air, except when it touches Pitchin Point. If it would run north of the bridge, it would interfere with the port. Therefore, the current preferred route would cross the Duwamish south of the bridge and then wrap around Pitchin Point. 
and then touch the top of Pitch and Point. And then through Youngstown, go up the hill. It would also take out the northern portion of the Duwamish Green Belt, which houses a heron colony, is important to the tribe and currently provides a great noise and emissions buffer between the houses and the bridge highway. The Seattle Planning Commission already asked Sound Transit in 2019 to find alternatives. So as it finishes passing around Pitch and Point, it comes out by the steel plant. And this is a illustration provided by Sound Transit, what the or different routes through Youngstown look like. The currently preferred alignment would be passing by the Youngstown Art Center and then continuing up the hill along Genesee passing the golf course. Another option is to push the station to the entrance of the steel plant and go up uh, along Andover and then either elevate it above Avalon or in a trough along the West Seattle Bridge or the bridge approach. But then people getting off the bus would have to watch out for all the trucks which are pulling in and out of the steel plant. So if you get up here, then this is the view. Uh, this is what it would look like as you look down along Genesee from Avalon. And so this uh, the the bridge which would extend about 15 stories high so you can see here that little car and then the base of those columns to get an idea of the magnitude of this bridge also shown here is all what is green here is i uh, the area i uh, the width of the corridor, which has to be cleared for construction. Now, if a tunnel, tunnel would be built, the guideways may be lower, but not only would construction get more expensive now, but if you ever want to extend the line beyond the junction, it would become very expensive to do so in a tunnel. Here's the kind of station Sound Transit builds. This is in Northgate. For West Seattle, Sound Transit envisions having a station like this along Fontleroy or replacing Jefferson Square or at Avalon or in Youngstown, but be about twice as high with three sets of escalators towering all over West Seattle's current buildings. So again, link stations are great way along freeways or arterials or for suburban transit centers. But in West Seattle, the guide rails and large stations will cause major disruption and displacement to West Seattle at a time it is already severely impacted by the bridge closure. Here are the numbers Sound Transit provided for the bridge approach. Some houses, I uh, and mostly businesses will be lost. And of course, uh, the green belt uh, along Pitch and Point. So this is the bridge approach. And then as it goes through Youngstown and up into the junction area, these are the options. So this is the preferred options. Uh, it would cost an additional to the in, in addition to the approach, so for a total of about $3.2 billion, uh, you would lose in this area 600 plus the, the bridge approach. So we are talking way more than 600 units, meaning uh, way more than a thousand people would be affected. And then an additional, uh, depending on exactly where it is, 30, 70 
60 uh, businesses and uh, the uh, and then the Longmire Park uh, is is the other uh, will would also have some impact. Now again, the Endover Street would uh, reduce those losses, but it would still be uh, considerable losses and the station would be in an awkward place as Sound Transit I uh, Sound Transit points out that it's further north and therefore I uh, more difficult to get to. And if you want to afterwards use the remaining construction space to build housing, I uh, that would be an awkward place to build housing because you would be squeezed between the highway and the and the steel plant. So uh, here's a map of Sound Transit's uh, light rail proposal. Again, uh, in red, it shows the light rail connecting Fontleroy Way or so, and uh, with Avalon and North Delridge across the Duwamish to Sodo, which currently is scheduled for 2032. And then in green, it would continue five years later, maybe, yeah, uh, to the second downtown tunnel uh, Sound Transit is planning to build. Now, we propose to serve the same three stations, the same three stations, but we would serve the junction directly and therefore connect the business district uh, there uh, via gondola with the rest of, of the stations. So by 2026, Skylink could connect to the existing light rail at Sodo and from there to the international district to connect with the Bellevue line, link line too, and the streetcar, Amtrak, and many other options so that we can get start getting more polluting cars off our roads. With light rail, you would have to wait until 2032 to get to Sodo only, only to have to wait for another train from Rainier Valley to take you to downtown. So you may lose 20 minutes just waiting for trains. Would that convince people to leave their car behind? A direct light rail connection won't happen until the second downtown tunnel is ready by 2030, 2037 at the earliest. And based on the latest plans, it will take a lot of walking to transfer, for example, to the Bellevue line. Let's give it a little bit history, you know, Rob. Ropeways have transported people for almost 100 years now, mostly for skiing and sightseeing. Recently, urban use has increased, which this map shows. The colors depict various technologies. Besides recreational use, North American cities are now adopting gondolas for reliable, high-capacity urban transit. Portland and New York already use them. Washington DC, Los Angeles, and other cities are considering them. Pittsburgh and San Diego have added them to their long range plan. So, uh, Vancouver BC found gondolas more efficient and more economical to serve Fraser University than buses and rail. Kirkland has been studying a line to connect the Stride uh, Rapid bus station they are about to build on I-405 and with the uh, along 85th with downtown Kirkland. The German government last year announced that they are studying gondolas as a standard transit technology option. Like Vancouver and several French cities, they found gondolas to be a superior option to meet their transit affordability and carbon reduction goals. 
what if Puget Sound would become the leading region for urban gondolas in the US? Here's an example of how Skyling may look like in West Seattle. This is from Mexico City, where they opened their first line in 2016, extending their metro into this, the neighborhoods. It carries 6 million people per year due to the incredible success. They just opened two more lines, one six mile line with six stations for up to 4,000 people per hour, very similar to what we are proposing. It was built for $157 million. It is already carrying 56,000 riders daily. Sound Transit studied gondolas when it compared various transit technologies in 2014. It said gondolas were appropriate high capacity transit options for connecting local areas to light rail trunk lines. A West Seattle connection wasn't even considered at the time, but when West Seattle was added to ST3 in 2016, light rail was just adopted by default. We believe gondolas could not only be a more prudent technology for West Seattle, but in the future may become a key technology for both Metro and Sound Transit to connect the link spine to more neighborhoods sooner, more frequent and affordably. Let's have a quick look at an existing gondola in London. It doesn't have to deal with the Duwamish, but in a instead the River Thames. In the middle of London, the Emirates airline connects both sides of the River Thames. Cabin, cabin circle on a wire continuously. Every 20 seconds, another cabin arrives and moves off the wire so that it can slow down for people to unload and others to board one of the cabins. Everybody has a quiet ride with a great view to stay clear of the river traffic. Very high towers were used for the Duwamish, we would not need to build them quite as high. A gondola station is typically much smaller than a light rail station. Some systems can carry up to 6,000 people an hour. It may include an escalator or elevator for people with disabilities, a stroller or a bike. Call buttons and a security camera may be included with a cabin so that operating personnel can monitor safety. The main components of a gondola are standardized and get to the construction site pre-assembled, allowing for quick, low impact and affordable construction and therefore low carbon footprint. While for light rail, you have to clear a 60 foot wide corridor along the tracks and even more for the stations. Gondola operation is highly automated and only costs about a third of running light rail trains. As the cabins are lightweight and powered by a central electric motor using clean energy, a gondola does not generate any emissions and efficiency is higher than electric buses or light rail. Gondola technology provides a separate transit corridor similar to light rail, but is much better suited for our hilly terrain and waterways. It can zip quietly above houses, traffic, and other obstacles while requiring just a few small towers. This means less displacement and property acquisitions, and it speeds up permitting. Going over Pigeon Point Ridge also minimizes interference with the port and the steel plant and stays out of the way of the West Seattle Bridge repair activities and ultimate replacement. A light rail station wipes out multiple blocks while the gondola station can even be placed above the existing intersection and therefore also allows for a lot more transit oriented housing development. Here's a rendering what a gondola uh, station may look like. A, you might arrive on a, on a light rail train and take the escalator uh, elevator up to the platform and you hop on one of the waiting gondolas, gondola cabins and off you go to downtown or wherever you are going. Or you arrive on a bus, take the escalator up, 
hop on one of the cabins and off you go. In summary, West Seattle could be connected with our light rail network much sooner for about a third of the cost running light rail up the hills to the junction. The gondola would provide similar capacity in total, tra total travel time, but with far less displacement and construction and therefore lower carbon footprint, something the current uh, environmental impact statement fails to even consider. And the savings could be used to build another light rail line through South Park to connect with the existing track in Taquilla to SeaTac and ultimately to Tacoma. A South Park station could, would allow another bus or gondola line to serve Greenbridge, White Center, Westwood, and even Fontleroy Ferry. And the existing Rainier Valley line could later be extended to Skyway and Renton. And it would double the capacity to get to SeaTac. If Sound Transit builds a, a gondola to West Seattle and uses the savings to build light rail to South Park and White Center, it can address West Seattle's transportation needs, include a more diverse ridership, meet climber goals more quickly, and provide more transit-oriented housing much sooner. Therefore, we ask Sound Transit to commission gondola experts to study such gondola line for about $200,000 so that it can be compared with light rail options. Thank you. And I, we are taking questions now. Let me I stop the recording.